first off, Mr. Raymond, thank you so much for speaking to me. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Uh, first off, I was wondering, where did you grow up? Because you said you liked the Red Sox and the Pirates, and this is kind of a Philadelphia area. We have Phillies here, so. Connecticut. 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 I grew up in a Red Sox family, and uh, uh, I was a lifelong Pirates fan. All right. Just to uh, be the black sheep of the family. So I was a lifelong Pirates fan, Steelers fan in the 70s with Terry Bradshaw and Lynn Swan and uh, that I kind of thing. And uh, But uh, I'm a Red Sox fan, too. Okay. They're, they're my hometown team. That's the, the ballpark I always went to as a kid. Did you play growing up? Yeah, I did. Baseball, yeah, through, straight up through high school. What was your position? Left out. Yeah, they left me out most of the time. But uh, I, I was actually... I was a pitcher straight up through like ninth grade, like senior little league JVs, and then I, uh, yeah, then I, I was left-handed, so I, they threw me in the outfield. But uh, whatever, I loved it. I yeah. played too. I uh, I did catcher and shortstop, but I like wow. left field or second. Cause it yeah, left field's easy. First it's... base was cool for me too. I never played that on a team competitively, but like you know beer league softball or radio station softball. When we had those teams, I would do, always do first base because, you know, not a lot of running around. Okay. Uh, what was your first experience with rock music? What was the first band that caught your attention and made you want to pursue other acts in the genre or just focus solely on them? I know you're a big ACDC and Stones fan. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I grew up, I was a 70s teenager, so I grew up in the era of AM Top 40 on the other blowtorch AM stations, WABC and WNBC out of New York. We would always hear that song on the Connecticut beaches when we're, you know, high school prom day after parties on the beach. The big stations were, you know, WNBC out of New York. And, you know, I wanted to be that guy. I was I, I was doing fake radio shows in my room, my bedroom when I was like 11. Being, you know, pretending I was, you know, I, I would hook up a little, you know, uh, microphone to like a little cassette player. I'd, I'd tape it to like a, a desk lamp and have that and then have my turntable and then my little cassette recorder that would, you know, I'd read ads. I'd read ads out of the newspaper for my commercials and things like that. And uh, ended up going to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting at age 13. So. I didn't know it was that old. Yes, it is that old. Yeah, yeah. So, so what did you go for there? Was Is there a particular different majors, or is it all one? Well, the story about the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, I was 13, and I guess my parents got so annoyed of me doing uh, radio shows in my bedroom with the speaker outside my door so somebody in the house could actually listen to this show mm -hmm. that uh, – you know, they took, it was basically like, a, you know, it was like a, like an open house, like uh, audition where they take you in, you know, take the new students in and give them the tour of the place. And then they have them read some copy in the production studio. You know, that's how they enroll students. And I was 13 and it got to the point where my father decided at that time that, you know, when he graduates in, you know, in 13 weeks, he's still not going to be old enough to get a job anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go there as a student. I, I did the audition. They're like, geez, this guy's a natural, blah, blah, blah. And I said, but my father didn't want to make that payment if, you know, I was still going to get out at age 13 and too young to work. And I ended up going to York College of Pennsylvania, communications, speech communications, four-year uh, four degree. And, uh, you know, when I saw the college radio station, I started to you know, because I was going to try out for the baseball team and whatnot, but I just, I saw the college radio station. I kind of lived there. So all else fell by the wayside. Okay. Yeah. So what was your break into radio mainstream? My break into radio um, was during college. I actually, because uh, I, I got right on the air at my college station as a freshman. And, uh, Again, it's one of those things like, you know, like these, like we're talking about musicians when they're, they're just like born to do something like an Eddie Van Halen or Angus Young or Keith Richards. These guys are like born with a guitar instead of a left arm. You know, that's their body part. That's like with me and radio. I, w I wanted to do it since I was 10. And 
by the time I got to college radio, I started firing tapes off to regular commercial stations. And I told you in the 70s, AM Top 40 was big. Mm -hmm. FMs weren't really, you know, they're like beautiful music stations. So I started, I wanted to be, you know, Top 40 DJ like I heard as a kid. So I just fired tapes out there and I got a call. I got a call back from the uh, this AM Top 40 station in town. And uh, my first shift as a paid DJ, a professional DJ, was on Easter Sunday. Because no one else, you know, I was a part-time guy, student. But my first shift was uh, Easter Sunday, 1979. And, uh, and by that summer, summer of 79, um, they really liked my work enough where they, you know, the overnight guys, you know, were as a revolving door. They couldn't keep a, a midnight to six guy in there to save their life. Mm -hmm. It was a little AM station. They asked me if I wanted to do it full time. And I really didn't want to go full time in radio at that point. I was a student. And, uh, but I would do all the hours I could. So I kind of just got roommates and lived uh, in York, Pennsylvania. And I rotated with another part time where we covered the, overnight graveyard shift and that was my entry into commercial radio okay yeah it's been that way ever since you know it's just like uh i've been that guy ever since you know so. i've heard a lot of different takes on the style used back in the day uh top 40 had a style rock had a style could you elaborate what those styles are as far as when speaking on the mic top 40 was you know, especially this all started in the AM Top 40 shotgun Top 40 days where you talked up the intros like I just did here uh, with ACDC. Kind of get it into your system a little bit. And so the AM presentation was was rapid fire, was forward motion, is, you know, keep the train rolling, boom, boom, boom. Keep all the songs and everything tight and, you know, just, you know, you want to sound slick and forward motion, you know, forward moving. And then when FM came in, uh, it, the the whole pitch, to, the whole sales pitch to FM was laid back. You know, hey, how you doing? You know, don't don't talk up any intros. Here's Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, on ninety two seven FM. You know, and then you just hit the song. You know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And there's it was just more of a the formatics were so different. It was you know it was like you know it's like pedal to the metal, top forty forward motion, and then rock. FM was, you know, slam on the brake a little bit and just be, you know, just slow the tempo down a little bit. What do you think attributed to FM taking over from AM? Sound quality. Quality. Uh, you know, they, and, you know, it's, it's, it's all a, you know, it's, it's kind of just all a progression, you know, as you, as you move through the years, you know, you had AM and, then you had FM frequency modulation, which was a smoother sound with less interference during, you know, thunderstorms. You didn't hear the crackles coming through. You know, it was a whole different setup and had further reach, had better reach, had better sound sound quality. That's that's the answer to your question. Okay. Uh, as opposed to your voice, I've had a couple of friends listen to you and I've always taken uh, opinions on DJs, voices, radio personalities, and I asked my friend two questions. What do they make you think of when you hear them, or who do they sound like? And when I asked about yours, the most common response was father figure, that friend that's always there, someone who's wise that's always got your back, Never, you can never repay them. I was wondering, when you speak on the mic, how do you feel when you present yourself to the audience? And how did you develop your style? Did you develop it off of any other DJs or... Was it just natural to you? Natural. I want to be honest here. I want to be natural. Uh, I've worked several different formats. So if there's any kind of difference, it would be in the pacing that the format called for. Like I just mentioned, top 40 is forward motion, faster pace, you know, you know, click, 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 you know, move it forward, blah, 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 blah. And rock is more like, I told you I was a music guy. So it's like, like a Pierre Robert, for example, you know, I listen to him. I want to be him. You know, you know how we, you know, when you're listening to him, the same thing. He, you know, he really edu an educator on the air. Like I just mentioned about the ACDC coming around to Philly. Tickets are on sale. You know, can't wait. So, 
that's the way I, I hear myself is, you know, you got your morning guys that are crazy that, uh, you know, can be funny and, uh, you know, off the wall and they're paid to do that. They're paid to be the morning personalities are, you know, are paid to, to get the notice, to pay to, to be the outrageous, you know, they're paid to be the, you know, the, the comedians, the, you know, did he just say that guy? Whereas me, you know, I, I'm the music guy. Uh, so if I can be informational or, you know, whatever. How did you come to the XL? Yeah. Working at a rock station in York, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for three years. Um, I was doing mornings. Uh, trying to be Howard Stern mornings. And that wasn't my forte. So I got replaced. I was out. Uh, that lasted three years. And I was uh, unemployed. I, I got fired. Uh, new consultant came in. I became the old consultant's morning man. So the new consultant, whenever you get new counsel, new, uh, uh, you know, consulting in there, they want their own people. They want their own print, you know. So, uh, you know, it's like baseball managers or football coaches. The old guy gets fired. The new guy comes in. He wants his own staff. So anyway, I was out of work. And the guy that hired me there, who, by the way, was a college friend. He's a radio guy. We went to college radio together, and we were friends. And he was the program director of that station. I was working up in Rhode Island. He says, I was getting married. My wife was in Pennsylvania, so I wanted to. She didn't, want, she didn't like being up there versus, you know, it's it just it's more expensive. And, you know, so it just happened that a couple months before I got married, my buddy called me and said, Steve, we have an opening. Come on down. So I went down. That's when I went to York Harrisburg. It's a classic rock station. And then I was out. Of, uh, that lasted three years, and I was out of work. Well, that guy that hired me in York, Pennsylvania, was fired a year before me down there. Landed here. Now, he wasn't program director or anything. He was a morning guy. Hmm. And uh, um, I was out of work collecting unemployment and sending my tapes out. And... Uh, on the day my last severance check came, five weeks to the day I was let go, and that's the, you know it's it's a rarity in this business when you can be out of work for just for just a month. Uh, but on the day my last severance check came, and I only got a month worth of pay, that was my severance. My buddy, who hired me there, was here for a year. Um, their program director gave notice; she was leaving, and my buddy Mike. Got the position because he was the assistant program director. So he got the position. He said, called me up. Steve, how you doing? Got an opening. Come on down. That's how I got here. And that's 1990. That was April 1st, 1990. 1990. Mm. So that's it's over 20 years here. It's 25. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. And I love the area. I said I was getting married that year, 1987, when I went from Rhode Island to Pennsylvania when he hired me the first time. So perfect. It just worked out, you know. I'm getting go back to Pennsylvania where my wife's family is, and uh, you know, because she had she had kids from a previous marriage, and uh, you know, less moving for them you know, when they're young kids like that. And it just worked out. And then I was out of work, unemployed, just sending tapes out and not getting returned phone calls and. Any response, and then my buddy calls me up and says, "Steve, our program director just gave notice. I got an opening. Come on down." So I just took it. No regrets, you know. Okay. For your show uh, today, back in the day when everything was still manual, how would you prep for the set list? I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's no problem whatsoever. I mean, I'm being interviewed for a student paper here, so I'm just... Oh! That's what I'm doing. How cool. And that's for Tommy. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me, I am really sorry. <laughs> Mind if I the door, please? Yeah, I don't need the door closed. There's no one here. Anyway, she's the, she's the traffic. She puts all the commercials in the automation. 
And uh, what she meant by pointers was, you know, they're in they're in the automation, mm -hmm. but I will I will tighten them up. I'll put like you know you know the end pointers on so they seg into the next thing seamless. I'm like that guy. I'm like, you know, I'm like anal with. It's my top forty instincts. You know, I just want to keep it. Boom, 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 boom. Anyway, so go ahead. Um, prepping for your show, right? Uh, how did you? How do you go in for your show? What are your main points you want to hit? Uh, there, do you have to spend 50 minutes ahead of time, write your show out, or can you come in and just crack the mic? I get here at 8 o'clock in the morning. I get here because I want to be here with the morning guys. I want to be able to listen to them from the other room and be around them, you know, just hang out with them. If there's something I really like, oh, I love that. That's got to be your promo, you know, that type of thing. And we got the morning guys here are just fantastic people. And uh, so I like getting here early. And what I'll do is I'll log on to Facebook. I, I got, you know, a rock, classic rock birthday list. Whose birthday is it today? So like the ZZ Top thing that you just heard. I brought, you know, I brought this uh, Billy Gibbons thing up. I just, I just Googled Billy Gibbons. I said, wait a minute, he had a, he had a solo CD out this year. So when I played Tush before, I'm like, man, when was it? And I could see like, you know, for example, on this thing. Said, uh, where is it? Said right here. When was it released? October 23rd, 2015. So, you know, if I get it, these days, in the old days, before the internet, I had rock magazines. I had Rolling Stone. I had a subscription to Rolling Stone. So you could kind of see what was coming out, what was happening. Less immediate. Another advantage about, you know, virtual. The virtual world here we live in is I see an ace, I see a, a ZZ Top song coming up on the grid here, which you just heard me do. Before I, when I saw that coming up like 10 minutes ahead of time, I was like, wait, a solo CD from 2015. Let me just, I Googled it and brought it up and you know, I'm recording saying, yeah, ZZ Top, blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, you know. So it's internet now, more immediate. And back in the day, was, uh, you know, the newspapers, magazines. Okay. Uh, I've listened to your interviews on SoundCloud. My favorite two were Vivian Campbell, which I think that's the most recent. Yeah, last month, yeah. And uh, Alice Cooper. I thoroughly enjoyed that one. Yeah. I was wondering, what's your approach to when you do interviews? My approach is simple. I'm such a fan. Like Alice Cooper, I had all his 45s as a kid. So, so there's been questions I wanted to ask him since I was playing his records as a 16-year-old. You know, there's questions I wanted to ask him about this, that, and the other thing. And then I watched the VH1 specials behind the music. I'm like you. Like, I'll just watch these things and study them. Oh, there's a question I can ask him. Or, you know, things like that. Uh, and I will YouTube. The old shows, the old interview shows, the behind the music. Oh, I got Alice Cooper doing a Halloween show in AC, you know, next month. And I got the email. Can you interview him? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to. Because there's question, the fan approach. I, I'm just a fan first, you know. Okay. Yeah. yeah I do. I do understand. Uh, my first show by myself and my buddy. Uh, you know the Power Rangers theme song? Yeah, yeah. Ron Wasserman was our first interview. Really? Uh, and I spent the whole week, I would get my homework done about, I always start around 10. I can't do homework during the day. Yeah, yeah. That's a problem of mine. So I got, start at 10, probably end at 12, 1, and then till 2 to 3 or 4, I'd just stay up looking at his interviews, trying to find something. A lot of repeats, but I found a lot of good stuff. It was just like, and then my favorite one was like, hey, what's 541 mean? Or, he was very generous, too. He gave us the whole show, which is about two hours. So that was really fun. Mm -hmm. but, uh, any interviews stand out particularly because of how well they went, who they were? You were just dying to interview them? Or uh, just best interview I ever had? Probably Regis Philbin. Regis back it was 1992 and he just he was coming here for i guess he's coming to do a show here at one of the casinos and it just so happened uh i got asked do you want to interview regis he's coming to 
the sands or, you know, whatever. And he was so fun. Like he, he addressed me, Steve, after every sentence. Like, you know, Steve, I got to tell you. Well, that's right, Steve. Listen, listen, hey, Steve, listen, if you come to the show, I, I want to, you know, I'll, I'll tell you more about it. You know, he was so personable that, you know, it made me feel special. Like Regis Philbin is calling me by name, you know. And uh, there's a bunch of them like that, you know. Alice Cooper was good, uh, you know. Uh, I, man, I just there's so many of them. Uh, another good one was Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd when he was opening the uh, um, the the House of Blues here at Showboat, which is now closed. But he came in and he when he was a partner, he would um, you know come roll into town on a motorcycle with his entourage and then open to do the ribbon cutting and whatnot. That was his thing when he, when he was involved in that business, we had him on the air. I was, I was actually doing a morning show then. And I, to prepare for that, I got the uh, Saturday night live, live in New York at Saturday night book, this big thick book. Mm-hmm. And one of the stories in here is when they were in rehearsals in that first year and Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray got into a, a wrestling match in a hallway and a punching and it had to be separated, you know, after one of the skits and rehearsals or whatever. And, uh, so that's one of the questions I asked him. And again, he said, Steve, I said, so, so I read the live from New York at Saturday night book. And it says that during your rehearsals, one of the rehearsals in your first season that, that, um, you know, you and Bill Murray went at it in the hallway and, you know, he, he you know, he literally kicked your ass and he goes, Oh, well, well, you know what? And then, and then and I said, so, so is this book, is this book live from New York at Saturday night, this big thick book? I said, is that accurate stuff? Like Bill Murray and you like having a fight and, and him kicking your ass and stuff like that. And he says, is that, yeah, it's probably, the book's probably 98% true. And by the way, I kicked his ass. You know, he just, you know, he was just a favorite interview. He's just so fun. So, uh, another thing I would like to ask: any magical moments? This I say magical because we're in an industry that allows once in a while somebody who wouldn't have been able to do something to have that that life moment. You know, I met my favorite rock star. I won these tickets, or I won money I needed. Do you recall any moments being on the air or being present for something that happened where the radio station or someone was able to win tickets or something and they really it was just a it was a boost to their morale um we do this fly home for the holidays contest every fall every november december and i remember one year um uh, we brought in this woman who wrote a letter in, you know, she was a, she was a military wife and her husband was in Afghanistan or someplace like that. And he had just gotten home after like two tours. And I remember and she was like one of the best, she was like one of the best winners. Cause we, we had them read their heartfelt letters on the air. Cause we chose them for their heartfelt letter. She's reading it. You know, I've been, you know, my, my husband's been gone for such and such a time and he's just coming home. And this is, you know, this is so, this is such an amazing blah, blah, blah. And I, I don't recall, but I think one of his family members who live further away was diagnosed with a disease or cancer or something like that. And we were flying. So we flew his parents in or one of some, one of his family members in and she just, she just lost it on on the air and just was crying and bawling her eyes out. How could this be happening to me? And I'm like, you know. I'm like, I'm like nodding to these, you know, the people in the studio. That's what this is all about. You know, that's what this is all about, you know. So that'd probably be one of them, you know. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to switch gears. Uh, Station history. Um, Wikipedia says the station signed to a rock genre in 1981. Uh, I believe it's closer to 86. Yeah, November 86, actually. Um and I, I, because I checked the Wikipedia on it, because for years and years and years, we've been, we we're trying to have 20th anniversary, because I've been here since 
the third year in, basically. I got here in 90. Right. When it's in its third year. So, I mean, I've been here for most of it, but I had to even get on Wikipedia because sometimes we would have bike bash parties where we wanted to honor the 20th anniversary or the 25th anniversary. And now we're closing in on 30. In 1981, it was a beautiful music. It was, you know, it was that Muzak uh, instrumental FM from the early 80s. And I think it had different call letters too, but ZXL Rock came into being in, in an 86. And, you know, and the same consultant who put the station on the air was the WMMR programming consultant at that time. So those guys came down and literally put us on as the little baby MMR, you know, the same consultant mm -hmm. firm. Okay. So that being said, I believe you're the most tenured person. Here. Yes, I am. How does that feel as a being able to have been here at the very, close to mm -hmm. at least the very, start, the very start and still be here to be the, the prophet, I would say, yeah. of the station. The, the voice. The voice. Um, I love it. Um, first and foremost, I love it. And I love the area. You know, when you get into, in the old days when you got into radio, the idea was you started a little station, like my little AM station in York, Pennsylvania, when I was 19. You work out from the little AM station to a bigger FM station, which I did. I went to a neighboring 50,000 watt top 40 station on FM shortly thereafter. And then you just, you want to move up in market size. So you, you want to go from market 100 to market 50, and then you want market 50 to market 20. In the old days, that meant a change in salary and, you know, prestige and, and whatnot. So it was always my aspiration to move up that ladder, you know, and then I got here in 1990. York Harrisburg is a little bigger market than here. Um, then I got here. I got married. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things where life happens. And then, uh, you know, here it is. You know, I, I have a joke with my friend who hired me here. Because when I, when I pulled into town, he, I looked around like, oh, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> you know, it's a beach town. <laughs> it's going to kill me. But I'm out of work. So I got to... And you know, but um, in the answer to your question, um, twenty five years later, you know, are there any regrets? Well, a lot of the people um, who are working at you know MMR in nineteen ninety are no longer there. Mm -hmm. They're moved on to other industries, or you know, Pierre's the you know the lone wolf there. He's the voice there, and. Um, I just, you know, it got to, you know, basically, love the station's a powerhouse. You know, I've been the program director since 93. Uh, it's a great company. You know, this is a pretty stable company. We're not clear, to, we're not one of the big conglomerates that just moves people in and out like they're just a number on a ledger that they could be eliminated, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the company is privately owned. The guy's here. Um, and it's a family, this girl that walked in, she's my sister, you know what I mean? So, you know, it, it's a, it's close knit when we have our problems and arguments and fights and, you know, our discussions and our meetings and our, you know, she comes in, can you fix these commercials for me? That's what she does. Of course I will. You don't see that in big groups. So the short story long I'm giving you again is I love it. Now, are you program director for all the stations? Just WZXL. Just WZXL? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, once you procured the uh, program director spot, what changes did you bring to the station? Because basically, what you're telling me is all the success, everything that's gone through, that's that's under your watch. So, I was wondering, what, what do you feel ch you changed to have it being so successful to where it is now today? Down through the years, and even for the people that are no longer here, you just surround yourself with good people. You know, my music, my my early music directors. The is the uh, you know is the assistant program director at the Ben FM now. You know, he does it on here at MGK. Say that one more time. I'm sorry. My old music director old who worked here. 
Okay. In the 90s. All right. Who left to go be a program director at another station in another market. Was my music director. We were. He was my midday guy. Rich DeSisto. Okay. And uh, we worked together here. Um, Jay Gleason, who, who was the internet webmaster for Greater Media, MMR, MGK, Ben, uh, PEN, you know that group up there. He we worked. He worked here. He started here. So the whole key. To, the whole key to success in in at a radio station is is the people. You know, the people as a group and their talents, you know. I just happen to be still here, but it's the people. Yeah. Yeah. In your own words, what does a program director do? There is it's a great question because uh, the the role has changed in the years since more grassroots, uh, more people, uh, more hands-on. Uh, program director in the old days was literally um, putting together promotions according to what was going on in the news. You know, uh, when O.J. Simpson was acquitted in '95, I ran out to Family Dollar and got big. I bought all the, you know, this little boxed orange juice, this little with the straw. I bought like two huge boxes of those things, and we did a free OJ weekend. Type, you know, the create the creativity of it all um, was was spearheaded by the program director, and then we would have meetings at the jock meetings and how to execute the promotion. You know, fast forward to the two thousands into twenty fifteen, uh, you have a marketing and promotions director for the whole group who will uh, formulate a uh, promotion with a client. Uh, you know, Golden Nugget does these uh, does these flashback Fridays. These are our promotions now. We do flashback Fridays to say a Golden Nugget. Well, this is initiated by our marketing and promotions director. And then she'll come to me and say, hey, Steve, uh, I just landed us every Friday night at uh, Flashback Fridays. Now all I do is assign DJs to these and I'll rotate the different, every Friday night, different, different weeks, I'll rotate. So I'm a facilitator of promotions now versus in the trenches going out and uh, buying my own little prize packs and that's where it's changed. It's just more corporate. It's more business. And there's times when I would, in the old days doing remotes, I would bring my uh, my own banner underneath my arm and just drive the van there myself and then tape up my banner where I was going to be broadcasting from and then have my phone, my old bag phone, my own you know, the old time cell phone. And that was our remote. Now we have street teams that you know, go there an hour before to set up our inflatable guitar. We we just show up there and stand by the table and, you know, give out uh, frisbees and, you know, CDs and whatnot. So the role has changed. It's, it's not, not so much change. It's just sort of like it's, uh, you know, it's just kind of morphed into something. Uh, when it comes to looking for the DJs that fit best for the station, what do you personally do as a program director when uh, going through their tapes, listening to them, interviewing them? Uh, what is the application process that you would put them through when looking for a disc jockey? Well, you got my first, my first, uh, my first inclination would be to get their their interest. What do they want to do? Where do they want to be? Because, you know, otherwise you're, we're just wasting each other's time if, you know, if they're coming in and, you know, uh, because it's less glamorous on this side. It's, you know, it's actual you know, work and you got to work to get better. And uh, so basically it's just getting their goals getting their goals. And, uh, you know, 
Uh, we've had interns here. We, we do a great summer intern program. I mean, a lot of the girls that come here, they they go to Cabrini or they go to, you know, Villanova or Rowan, especially. And they'll be here for summer interns, helping us set up at our remotes and whatnot. And some of them, like you're just doing, will come in and, you know, and uh, ask for, you know, what should I be doing with this? What should I, how should I apply for this job? How should I apply for that job? And then, you know, you, they just ask them their goals. Well, I don't want so much in radio. I don't want to be on air. I want to be more in marketing. I'm, I'm going to go for a job at, you know, Comcast in Philly for marketing. And the rule of thumb, I just tell all these kids, I said, if there's one thing you should take from here is that people, the consumer, the consumer, they don't know what they like, what they like, what they know. And that's how you set up your marketing campaigns, your, you know, you know, that's what Donald Trump is, is, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's what he's tapping into. The people, they don't know what they like. They're frustrated with politics and politicians. They don't know what they like, but they like what they know. They like what he's saying, right? That's what he's tapping into. And, you know, so I, I tell these people, you know, like these girls, they'll say, I want to go into marketing. I want to go into public relations. It's, you know, it's a big popular thing. Very, women can really pull it off because, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're just good at it. Like our marketing director here, Shannon, she's just, she's just good at it. She's, you know, a little bulldog. She, she doesn't take no for an answer. Women are, can be that way and get away with it. But it's, yeah, people don't know what they like, but they like what, you know, that's how you got to present it. So you get your product out there. That's great. As far as the station dealing with the record companies, could you explain what the process is for when tickets are distributed to the station to giveaways, when talent or rock stars are able to come on for interviews? How does that work between the station and the record companies and the symbiosis? Um, personally, I've been trying to call, email, and I understand it's Probably not going to happen because I'm on not even close to a medium of this will benefit them. But I was curious to how the major stations actually did it. Okay, so first of all, in the old days, I'll say it again, record companies spearheaded artist relations. They would pick them up at the airport. They would drive them to radio stations. They would set up their interviews. They would set them up at their hotels. They would bring them back to the airport and send them to their next market for promo, the promo tours, right? That's what you're talking about. Bring them in here. I had Don Felder in here from the Eagles when he was coming to Golden Nugget three years ago. I had him sit right there. You know, I had the Eagles poster because he wrote Hotel California. I was playing it with him sitting there. I said, that's your guitar solo right there, right? He goes, that's it. That's me. And, uh, you know, and nowadays, there are no record companies. There's no record, there's no dedicated record promotion where, you know, where they, they'll bring around. Now, I'm not saying they, uh, the, the top tier of A-list a people like Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber, I mean, they still have their representation. But for us, it's no longer record companies. It's who's performing at these casinos, Golden Nugget, uh, Tropicana, uh, Borgata, and well, they're on the air with us. So our sales rep in securing the advertising buy for uh, the Leonard Skinner show at the event center at Borgata, that comes with tickets. And you know, we'll give you a 10 pair of tickets to give away in a promotion so you can talk up our show as part of the advertising buy. So all our interviews now come by way of, um, you know, they come by way of the advertising buy set up through the uh, entertainment department at the actual businesses. Alice Cooper was that way. Uh, Vivian Campbell's a little different because I know their rep and she's out on the West Coast. So if they got anything coming up, she'll call us. Hey, can you have them on here? Because they're coming to Atlantic City. And get them on. That's a little different. But nowadays, it's less record. There are less record people. Um, it's that's That industry sort of dissolved. Now it's, uh, you know, now it's everyone... You know the, the the record 
the artists themselves have their own uh, tour management that works with the venue. The venue will buy advertising from us and say, oh, by the way, if I'm spending this money to advertise our show, can you interview so-and-so? Sure. That's so you want to go for the marketing uh, representation? Yes. The- you know, if you're sitting there at your college station and there's someone coming to your school, talk to the the uh, entertainment, talk to the uh, you know, the, the entertainment department that's bringing them in, asking them, because they're the ones who bring them in, you know. And uh, as part of, you know, hey, man, you know, they're coming, they're, you know, they're playing here, you know, coming up in February. Can, you know, if you get a phone or, you know, they want the promotion. And the artist wants the promotion. Right. So that, that the day of, you know, people not showing up or, you know, I've had a number of bad interviews where, I couldn't even air them, you know. So, but those days are over. Okay. Um, no, these are my favorite questions. So we're nearing the end of all the seriousness. Um, like I said, when I did contact you, re- quick about the response. Uh, very generous, willing to give me wisdom. I was wondering, in your pursuit of your career, was there anybody that was a guiding light to you, or was a, a mentor? really helped you get to where you are now? Um, as far as mentors, uh, probably my first uh, station manager at my college radio station, who uh, he was probably my first mentor. He, you know, everyone wanted to be him, deep voice, and you know, just so smooth. And he's the guy who put me on the air first, as a, like I said, an 18 year old kid. And then my high school baseball coach, you know, because he was, you know, he's the one who signed my high school yearbook. You know, if, you know, if, if your life is anything like you played in baseball, your, your life will be successful, that kind of thing. I mean, he was, a, he, you know, he worked me really hard and showed me, you know, how hard work can pay off. And then my theater teacher, because I did a lot of plays. And yeah. so uh, my theater teacher back in high school in summer theater who always told me, you know, do what you love, you know, the money will follow. You know, don't do, don't just, don't just leave something you love for, you know, for a paycheck and hate it. You know, because I was, I was, did a lot of plays. I, you know, he, he says, you're really good, you know, just remember, do what you love and uh, everything else will follow. So my baseball coach, my first station manager, my baseball, high school baseball coach, and uh, my theater coach and my dad, who said to me in my first radio job, because I, again, I was 19, 20 years old, and I, all I want to be was on that WNBC New York station. And I was at point A, and I wanted to get to point Z without doing everything in between. So he says, Steve, listen to me. You know, you'll get there. He says, but you can't go from A to Z without doing all the letters in between. So whatever you do in life, at whatever level you do, if you love it and you know, and you got a goal from A to Z, just make sure you do all those letters in between. And you'll be successful. And I feel like I've done that. Yeah. That would be the next question. Uh, what is the best advice that comes to mind that you've given or someone's given you that uh, pops into your head first would be that what my father said to me because the young people today uh, the young people today don't have that they they don't have that built in they don't have that you know get from point a to z you gotta do all the letters in between there's there's you know it's pay your dues time whereas as you know today young people younger than you, you know, uh, they want it now. And if, you know, they'll stay in a job six weeks if they're not feeling it, you know, mm-hmm. without, so just do all the letters, just do all the letters. That's, that's. Okay. Do you have any career goals that you would like to achieve still? Uh, career goals that I would like to achieve. 
Um, hmm. Like the B. Well, I mean, maybe station ownership at some point. Um, I was aspire to doing that. Um, that'd probably be my next logical um, move, you know, is the station ownership. Uh, Got to see where it goes first. You see, you know, there's, like I said, technology is exploding right now. Mm -hmm. Phones, you know, cellular, and, you know, apps and things like that. So, but yeah, it's in the back of my mind, station ownership. As a DJ or a program director, mm -hmm. I was wondering, what is one aspect of your job that's elementary, basic, but because it is elementary and basic, it tends to be forgotten, and that can hinder the job, if it is. Um, Please excuse the wording. Yeah, no. Say that again. Um, an aspect of your job mm -hmm. where... Because it's so simple, or because it's it's one of those things like, yeah, everybody knows that. But because it is so important, it's still forgotten. And if it is forgotten, it, it can be very detrimental. Um, one DJ said, cracking the mic on and off. Some guys forgot to turn it off. They've been fired for what's been said. Some guys, they'll have the greatest post in the world, and then they'll look, and then nothing's on. Um, other people would say... Uh, Commitment, staying focused. Yeah, staying focused and commitment. But uh, my big thing, and I'm very, I'm very, people look at me, oh, you're so laid back, you're so calm, you're so quiet, you're, you're so quiet. But I'm so anal about what you're just saying. Like, for example, I'll be driving around and I'll hear like a song just cut off. Now, it could be, you know, the digital automation, something went wrong, so there's a glitch, maybe a you know, power surge in the, in, the, in the electricity in the building or, but I'll hear, like, I'll be driving around and I'll hear something that just jumps at me, like a song cuts off or a commercial ends and there's dead air. You're dead air, dead air. That's, you know, you always got to investigate that. Why did that happen? I'll be driving around and hear a song cut off and I'll be, I'll have to come in and I'll have to look at, you know, I'll have to go into the computer. Look, why did that? And I'll have to adjust the song, you know, I'll have to like fix the recording of it, you know, maybe record it in there again because I can't get, that can't happen again. So my, you know, my focus, my ultra, my ultra focus would be on um, sound quality and, uh, you know, the sound elements working. Yeah. Okay. Any advice for anyone trying to make it in the industry? Learn everything and be a great multitasker. Because the job is not as one-dimensional as it was in years past. No one goes to school to be a DJ. You go to work, you go to work at a radio station to be a DJ, guess what? You, you might be asked to go help set up the inflatable guitar at the next remote or... You might be, you know, you might be asked to, uh, you, you'll be asked to do production. And a lot of times you'll, you'll record a spot maybe five times till you get it right in your head, right? Mm -hmm. And then it'll be perfect. And the next day a salesperson will say, hey, yeah, the advertiser loved the commercial, but I'm sorry, I got the phone number wrong. Can you record it again with the right phone number? Things like that. So learn everything. Become, you know, be a multitasker. And the best part of the, the best advice, love it. You know, love it. You've got to love it. Steven Tyler once said, I watched American Isle one year, he says to some cocky uh, uh, contestant who sang a song and they're critiquing him. And he was like, the contestant was like having a hard time with the critique. And Steven Tyler says, you know what? You're a great singer. You've got lots of skill. You're gifted. But your attitude in this business, the music business will kick your ass with an attitude like that. Love it. Learn it. Live it. 
and you know, but love it, you know, and you'll you'll be successful. Okay. Right. And my final question is favorite ACDC song. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. Bon Scott, ACDC, with the bagpipes. That's my favorite ACDC. It's tough. There are many others, but uh, that that'd be my ultimate favorite. I got two and two. Do you? Yeah. It's it started it. That Brian may have got them to the the world status. Bon yes, bon I am Scott. a Bon Scott. There's a song on on uh, Powerage called Overdose. No, that's Let There Be Rock. Let There Be Rock. And I just put it on my iPod. And Overdose, great guitar. I'm trying to learn that those opening chords. And uh, also on that album is... Uh, oh, man, what else is on that album that I, I just... I just downloaded a bunch of songs from there. Dog Eat Dog, Go Down... Hell ain't a bad place to be. Oh, that's good too. Whole lot of Rosie. Of course, let there be Bad Boy Boogie. That's my Bad second. Boy Boogie. That's my second. Great guitar. Yeah, I love that. Hi, this is Steve Raymond. You're listening to my buddy John the Ninja. 89.1 WYBF. Ooh, baby, you listen to John the Ninja. Oh, your ears are about to go on a vacation. John the Ninja's got what you need.